go. And we're live. Thanks a lot for tuning in to this week's Tuesday Night Live. I have a special guest here, Ridwan Hannon from One Path Accountants. Uh, hey, guys. We'd planned for this before we realised that it was the budget, budget day. Well, we've got the budget coming out today. Mini budget. So, mini budget. So <coughs> it will be interesting. We will be bringing you, maybe you want to come over a little bit so we yeah, can I'll see on the screen. In. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, got a lot of things to talk about today. Um, this may go a little bit longer today because we're going to be talking about, I normally, what I normally do these days, read is I go through news, show everyone all the communist things that's going on in the world, talk about all the, the crazy conspiracy theories that, you know, they might sound a conspiracy theory to start off with, but then they become a fact. So it's like, you know. Well, we'll see truth. in the budget today that some of the things you predicted might sort of come out. true. Yeah. And then, um, <coughs> then we go through that. Then I'll talk about a topic. So we're going to talk about, we're going to have Ridmo today talking about um, understanding the importance of a trust and a trust structure, when to use it, when not to use it, all those sorts of things. Um, we've got a few little charts. Unfortunately, for those of you watching on uh, Facebook Live and for anyone that watches this video afterwards, um, when we go live, we're not, a, we're not able to run it like a webinar. It's, mm -hmm. like it's, it's confined to what's in the Facebook Live app. So we can't actually bring screens into here. So it's on a piece of paper. That's why I hold up the paper for you guys. Yeah, so we won't be showing you a couple of bits of paper, but if you need any of this information, uh, you can contact Richard. the team and... Yeah. Go from there. So we're going to talk about different types of trusts that are out there. Uh, talking about super fund, I think a lot of people want to know, uh, especially in the world today. You know, stock market crashing. We're seeing GFC 2.0, the GFD that I talked about many years ago. Um, I think that there's a very finite. Um, the doors closing on being able to protect your super fund. Uh, whilst Ridwan can't give you the financial advice, he can talk about the general context of how to set up a super fund and you know the parameters of what you go through from your part of doing a super fund Correct. set up. Um, and then we'll go through a recap of the budget. So it's yeah, we've got some pre-budget info, so we'll try and map that out against what we get through live. So it'll be a genuine live today, uh, getting some live data from the uh, budget from a couple of the guys on the ground, so we'll go from there. It's always a genuine live, mate. Uh, <laughs> I throw around a piece of paper and I'm like, fuck, look at this news article, and uh, we've got some we've got some doozies today. So uh, get into it. Let's get straight onto it. So we've got a, a couple of uh, <coughs> comments here. The Wolves of Australia. I don't know about a Wolf of Australia. Um, Ginger, how are you going? Uh, Amber, I hope you're doing well. Thanks a lot for tuning in. And uh, I'm going to get run straight into today's uh, topic. So this one here is an article. Some of the things that are actually very, very scary, right? So this here is an article from Services Australia. If you um, are not on Birchfeed, I encourage you uh, when After the Live is finished to go to birchfeed.com, B-I-R-C-H-F-E-E-D.com. It's free. You don't need to be a tight ass. Don't need to think about, oh, I've got to spend some money. It's free, right? You can spend your night watching all the devilish stuff on Netflix and all the programming that they do. All the shows, have you looked at it, right? It's all got satanic shit through it, right? It's all There's this a bit like, of a flavor, even for yeah. the... Uh... Marvel super comics in exactly right it's all satanic stuff right i'm not even a religious person but um you know you can go and watch that or you can go and watch birch feed which is free and you can go and watch what i'm looking at and the information and the data that i share with everyone every week and um you know i always talk about it's it's not a, a property game it's a finance game it's a banker's game that we're playing here and um, outside of that chessboard, it's all the inputs from the government and the controlling entities and all that sort of stuff. And you know, we're here in a world now where the, we've got Gladys, who used to be the Premier of New South Wales. She got shit canned. She, now she's like the head of Optus or something. Head of Optus gets um, Optus gets all their data hacked, and suddenly they're linking up with New South Wales Services Australia and all these sort of things and data matching. So this is very very ugly here data matching activities for the Medibank private AHM and Optus breaches, right? Matching data <coughs> is one key, one of the key controls we use to assist customers in preventing fraud and non-compliance. What is non-compliance? It sounds like social credit system coming right in here, right? What are we doing? When we match data, we compare the information we get from an outside source with our own. We're data matching our Medicare and Centrelink customer records with information about Medibank private AHM and Optus customers affected by the recent data breaches. We're doing this to identify any customer at risk of identity compromise to prevent fraud. It sounds very much like, right, the last two years we've been like, if we we're talking about this beforehand, mm. about, you know, if you or I were sick, we're in the hospital, it's like going back six months later and we're probably dead, we've got like, you know, cancer or something really bad, our legs removed, our, you know, something's happened to us. You know, we're not getting texted and called 
five times a day to say, hey, come into the local clinic and get your free, you know, injection, right? <laughs> and it's like, why are they so incentivized? Why are they so motivated by this? Like, I don't think any of us really know the answers to this, right? But when we're starting to look at the next level of this, <clears throat> we have a financial system issue and it's imploding. Um, we have the death of our currency. I'm going to go through some interesting papers out of the US, which are not news articles today. They're actually stuff from the president's website and they've you can, their links are all in Birch Feed. You can go and look and do it yourself. But we're going into a digital world. We're losing our currency. The currency is losing all of its value. Like every currency has, um, uh, throughout history, there's been at least 10,000 currencies that have all turned to nothing via a hyperinflation. Uh, we were also talking beforehand. Mm. Maybe you want to share your recent <coughs> trip overseas, the currency that you're using. You yeah, so I actually went to Singapore to watch the F1 because I'm a bit of an F1 fan. Mm -hmm. And on the back end of that, we went across to Indonesia. So Singapore is much mm -hmm. like us, you know, you yeah. buy a Big Mac, it's whatever, I yeah. don't know what it costs now, five, six bucks, seven bucks, eight bucks. Mm -hmm. And um, we went across to, um, to Indonesia and it was really hard to get your head around it. So if you wanted to buy um, shampoo, it was yeah. $40,000. <laughs> So we started getting stuck, and I'm an accountant, we started getting stuck with the currency conversion because it's 10,000 to one. So we went out for dinner and they gave us a bill for 600,000. And I thought, my mate, oh, crap, I think the bill is 600 bucks. <laughs> and so then <clears throat> I was having a chat because as I do, because I work with Nathan and the rest of the, you know, the clients, property is always an interest to me. So I went and checked out a couple of the properties. And, uh, and one of the sales ladies like, oh, what would you like? And I was like, well, I'm from Australia, I'd like to invest. She's like, oh, okay, fantastic. It's a brand you got new, money. <laughs> it's a brand new, four better. Uh, small pool, um, yeah. you know, nice, you know, what you'd see probably out in Kellyville or Ponds or whatever it is. Yeah. I go, oh, how much is that? She goes, um, it's 2.1 billion rupees. And I was like, uh, so what's that in dollars? And she's like, and she's like, actually, I don't know, I've got to get the calculator out. And it was just, you can see that dilution and sort of the deflationary aspects of that money, um, which yeah. people thought would come away, has just gone the reverse and it's just, gone crazy inflation i don't have any bug <coughs> on me right i don't actually carry any but like used to have pennies in the country right that it went to dollars and uh, actually i actually bought know. you back some coins and if you see their coins now it's actually printed on like um almost tin foil bottle, 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 bottle caps, caps right? yeah yeah so like because a bottle cap like printing with, it right yeah. so i actually had some money i was going to bring it in the other pants yeah. um you know a note uh, uh 10 cents <laughs> is a thousand dollar note yeah right? so it's all the things that we've been talking about that you don't think you'll see especially you know Indonesia not being, you know, really that far away from us and not really dis it's not Venezuela, it's not Africa, it's all these, you know, it's quite a you know, proximity wise quite close. Yeah. Um, and you're sort of dealing with it and so you can see okay how the inflationary pressures um, are going to necessarily not get to that stage, but take hold in Australia what we're seeing now. Six percent, six point eight percent, seven point five percent predicted for next quarter. It's runaway inflation. Yeah, so it is getting becoming a problem, right? And I think in the budget today you'll see that um, that's going to be the, the main topic or the main aspect in which you're trying to control. When we look at that, right, so that's Australia, that's Services Australia, right, that's .gov.au, right, data matching activities for, you know, all these common places. Yeah, we look, can, the tax can. office has been doing data matching and information matching we've been talking about for years. Yeah. Um, so I think now it's um, front and centre. Here we are looking at um, this, this guy, right, this guy, it's funny, right, you had in the UK that dumb and dumber bloke, right? <laughs> yeah, Trump. And now you got this guy, right? He's like, oh, boo, 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 right? <laughs> it's so famous, this guy. No, no I'm, comment. I'm politically. <laughs> uh, Rid's very conservative, so he's not going to jump into my uh, on my uh, commentary here, but he's like, oh, boo, 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 right? <laughs> this guy, right? So this is from the presidency.ucsb.edu, right? This is from the president's website. There was two pages that I had of this. There was uh, another one. Uh, uh, I think it's missing. There was, there was two links that I had surrounding this, right? Um, and this is very, very um, scary, shall we call it, right? So if you go online and look up this, you can do this in your own sort of time. We won't go through it all in the context, all in depth today, but Executive Order 14067, right? It's an executive order that was published um, only a couple of months ago, March the 9th, 2022, um, is when this got um, passed, right? And it goes, by the authority vested in me as the president of the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America, it is hereby followed orders follow. Section one, policy. The advances in digital and distributed ledger technology for financial services 
have led to dramatic growth in markets for digital assets with profound implications for protection of customers, investors and business, including data privacy and security, financial stability and systemic risk, crime, national security and the ability to exercise human rights, financial inclusion and equity and energy demand and climate change, right? They've put all these things in, in title right? Up. <laughs> title up. In November 2021, non-state issued digital assets reached a combined market capitalization of three trillion up from approximately 14 billion in early 2016. Monetary, monetary authorities are globally exploring, in some cases, introducing central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. While many activities involving digital assets are within scope of existing domestic laws and regulations, an era where the United States has been a global leader, growing development and adoption of digital assets. Jimmy, years ago, they said, oh, it's all a scam. Mm. You know, it goes in to say the objectives, principal policy objectives in the United States with respect to digital assets are follows. We must protect our consumers, investors, businesses in the United States, unique varied features of digital assets. We must protect the United States global financial stability, mitigate systemic risk. We must mitigate, I'm just going to read the top down because this is like a big document here, right? It's the executive order, um, executive order 14067. Um, AML, which is any money laundering, we must reinforce United States leadership in the global financial system and in technological and economic competitiveness. Uh, we must promote access to safe and affordable financial services. We must support technico technological advances and promote responsible development and use of digital assets. Coordination um, policy, sovereign money is the core of well-functioning financial system, macroeconomic sta stabilization policies. So all these little things that people don't read, they're like they're too interested in watching what's on Netflix or, oh, I better go and work out what I'm going to party this weekend or whatever mm. the case may be. But people aren't caring about the world they live in. They don't understand that they're being fleeced every day of the week and these things are out to get them. Um, so this is basically, in short, um, here we go. Within 90 days of the date of this order, the Attorney General, in consultation with the Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury and the Secretary of Homeland Security, shall submit a report to the President on how to strengthen the international law enforcement cooperation for detecting, investigating, prosecuting criminal activity regarding digital assets. The term blockchain, blah, blah, and it goes into, sounds like Bitcoin, right, but they're implementing central bank digital currencies. That came out in March 2021. What happened in March 2021? every country started pushing the interest rates up, right? Everyone started a liquidity squeeze, which will force people into going into this digital world mm. that we're heading into. I had more articles on this, uh, which I'm going to see uh, if I can find here. Uh, President, um, I sent it on to my team. There was two articles to print out um, for today. And I'm just gonna see if I can find the other article because it was very, Interesting. Sure. So, while you're looking for that, I mean, in terms of how you look at that, we're going to have to move to this particular phase of the economic and the um, the broader social impacts of digital currencies and digital monitoring. Yeah. What's your What's your thoughts on how to navigate it? You know, is it concerning for you personally? For me, I'm okay with it. I know that a lot of people, even some of my clients. Um, next to me, uh, yeah. you know, concerned with it. Um, so you're in a position where you either learn to love it, learn to live with it, or live outside of it. Yeah. Uh, look, I think we're stuck in this system uh, where, where we've been born into obeying without questioning, right? Um, we've got systems that control us. You've got, um, you know, everyone's taught up with belief systems, right? Death and taxes, you can't, you can't, you know, avoid them. Well, they never had taxes 200 years ago, right? They didn't have taxes. There wasn't a tax system 200 years. How was the history of the tax system? Do you know? Like if Look, they've always had some level of tax. To, well, like a tea tax, not like the to, level of To tax. allow for, you know, social yeah. and uh, other economic elements to be carried out. Yeah. Um, I think, though, what you're referring to is the fact that every aspect of your life, direct and indirect, has some level of tax, council rates, tolls, yeah. all these other different Everything. type of things. Right of carriage, right of use tax. So here, here we are, I've got a, um, a sort of um, uh, phone cover on my phone, so it might be a bit weird to see at some points because of the privacy screen. Secretary statements and remarks. Statement from Secretary of Treasury Janet Yellen on the release of digital assets. So this is from the United States, home.treasury.gov, right? This is from the Treasury's website. Um, 
on September the 16th, 2022, Washington, the United States Department of Treasury today published three reports pursuant to sections four, five, and seven of President Joe Biden's executive order 14067 on ensuring responsible development of digital assets. The reports address the future of money and payment systems, consumer and investor protection, and illicit finance risks. Mm -hmm. What's illicit? Two people want to trade. I'll swap you this bottle of water for whatever. Right? But they're saying it's illicit, right? You don't think that bad things have been done with cash before, but they cannot control cash, mm. right? They can control this. They can see what you're doing. If they don't like you, they turn you off, and it's very much identical to the Chinese social credit system. And a lot of people aren't looking at it. Like I think this is the biggest threat that any of our lives have ever seen because it control it takes, it takes us to communism. Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a big leap, but look, the reality of how I think, although I'm quite different the way that you think in some of these things. Of course. I, d I do think that there is a problem with, for example, you've got editor editorial governance, which is getting, to some extent, overlaid to social media. So you've got Instagram, you've got Facebook, you've got YouTube, where yeah. someone doesn't like what you say, they raise it as a concern and you get banned. Yeah. So the free speech aspect and the ability for that editorial governance by someone whom you don't know, you're you're posting on a platform, right? Yeah. So I think that's that's the critical part here, like as in what do you sacrifice to be able to retain in terms of, you know, um, intrinsic rights, you know, freedom of speech and all those other types of things. And censorship out there, censorship, you can't say the things that are need to be. <coughs> uh, if you if you look at, um, this takes me to my third one, these are a couple of articles out here. This guy here, you might not think of it as much, right? You've got here Rishi Sunak, or whatever you pronounce his name. Yeah. Um, to become Australia, uh, UK's next Prime Minister. Um, so the, you had Dumb and Dumber bloke, and then you had some chick that lasted 45 days, right? Lettuce, lettuce outlasted her. Hey? <coughs> they have a meme that the lettuce outlasted her. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, now we've got this guy who, there's an article I posted in the Birch feed, it's a video, which was um, from seven months ago, saying that this guy was going to get booted in, voted in, because he is a part of the World Economic Forum, right? And you've got these entities such as the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, and those sort of entities which are pushing their way through power to have control and be able to have a, a, a spokesperson. And um, the video that I shared, it's about a half an hour video, it's in Birch Feed. Uh, go watch it, I posted it there today. Um, very, very important to go watch it because then you're starting to see that you've got these new avatars that are appearing that who is controlling them? There's the, the the, the prime ministers, the presidents, the leaders, they're bought and sold. And then, you know, if someone doesn't follow the rhetoric, then, you know, they turn them out to be a bad guy, right? You know, you've got a, a Saudi, who was it? You've got um, Gaddafi, you've got Saddam, you've got all these mm. uh, people that were killed and murdered, and you've got Putin that's a bad bloke now, uh, all these sorts of things. And you've got to ask, well, why? Why did they behave in that way? Mm. You've got these guys that are being paste, paste, posted there. They're an avatar for uh, a hidden agenda. And you start seeing all their agendas that are starting to get rolled out. So um, on that, I've got two very basic and boring type of articles we're going to read, but it's actually quite interesting just as you read through them. So this one here is from news.com. Um, it's could the report, could this report silence the boomer versus millennial debate? I'll give you an amazing stat on that after you finish. Okay. Well, what I find funny is that they go, oh, it's because of the boomers, right? They bought their house for 50 grand. They're robbing everybody. You know, how dare they, right? They work their ass off with 20% interest rates, whatever the case may be. And you get the other side that goes, oh, it's because they have, you know, avocado and toast and shit, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, like there's so many, um, there's so many other parameters, right? I've never heard them go onto the news and say, well, the RBA has robbed everyone. The money printing has controlled the inflation. We've got, it was caused the inflation. Uh, there's lots of things that are never talked about, right? And as we go through it, it goes, I'll read the article, it's pretty fun. Um, it goes, the charts prove the boomers are, are right. Was it really easy to own a home back in the day or a millennials just pack of smashed avocado whinges? <laughs> and which generation is better educated? A new analysis from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Oh, really great, right? We've got a trustworthy Australian Bureau of Statistics that manipulates and cooks the books with their statistics every year, right? <laughs> They're there, uh, CPI, it's all be 7% oil, inflation is high. 
Fucking everything's got more than 6%. What's gone up by 6% this year? Tell me what's gone up less than 6%. Probably a smaller list of things that have gone up by 6% are things that have yeah, gone up over that, right? Maybe that one, yeah. So they're lies, right? But they bring them in, they go, um, back in my day, does it best settle some of the aged old millennial versus boomer debates? They've pulled these lies in uh, to, to give them credit, which have no doubt bitted plenty of Australian family dinners. Like some of the statistical time machine, when the report analyzes census data from 1991, 2006, 2021, painting a picture of social and economic climate when boomers and Gen X were the same age as millennials. This article takes a step back into intergenerational conversation discussing content that is usually pre preceded by a statement like, back in my day, overview reads. Well, back in my day, our currency hadn't been manipulated, ripped apart and destroyed at the level that it has. I ain't gonna see this, either. I know I haven't, right? Home ownership is on the decline, of course, because no one can afford it, right? Mm -hmm. Renting's gonna be on the decline soon, right? Among the, among the findings uh, was a significant downward trend in home ownership through the generations. The report found that when baby boomers were in their 20s and 30s in 1991, 65.8% owned a house outright and or had a mortgage. Today, only 55% of Aussies owned age between 25 and 30 line millennials are homeowners compared to 62% of Generation X. Uh, two thirds of boomers when they were the same age. The report comparing millennials with early generations noted boomers in 1991 were three times more likely than millennials in 2020 to own a home outright. Uh, millennials own less than they, but own less, but they earn more. Mm. But why? Why is all their money going? Right? Is it going on holidays? Is it going to tiki? Is it going wherever? It's going to the fact that you're paying a fucking Big Mac meal. 15, 20 bucks, right? You go to a shop, there's a burger shop around there, they sell a burger, it's a shit burger, it's like deep fried and throw it, whatever. And it's like 30 bucks for a burger. It's yeah. like, it's, and they don't give you a drink, you have to buy the drink and the chip <coughs> separate, right? And it's like, this is a very different world than beforehand, right? Yeah, like a sure. $2 bag of chips would feed the family. You remember as a kid, oh, I'll have $2 of chips, thanks, you get a big fucking and bag of dinner's it. box. The, the dinner box and all that stuff, oh, it's right? great. 30 cent ice cream cone, now it's like a buck, a buck <laughs> 50, a <laughs> fucking goop out of a machine. Um, yeah, so when you look at that, none of these articles, like they, they, they have it out there, it's Generation X, it's Baby yeah, Boomers, look. it's all these people, but no one's touching the real story apart from us, like when I go on live and have a rant about things, but we're starting to really see it, and a lot of people are starting to wake up, we've got 75 viewers at the moment that are watching, there's thousands of people that watch this the day after, people are starting to go okay hang on a second this isn't right there, there is things and the more people that catch on to that that's when you're going to start seeing the fabric of our currency fall apart and mm. people have no confidence in it and it takes me to another point just on that if we look at the market at the moment i speak to lots of agents every week i speak to hundreds of agents every week um and always ask them like what's going on in the area and stuff like that and most people would go and watch the news and go oh the property prices are falling well in some pockets they are falling which is great i wish they'd all fall i wish the whole market would collapse right but the thing that's very different today is that people have no confidence in the dollar mm. that's why there's a lack of stock out there in the market people don't want to trade their property for money because yeah. they're not going to be able to afford it again because they can see the level of inflation why would you sell something when you can just keep holding it through a different market cycle you're seeing inflation in the rents you're seeing inflation happening every single other place the value of the money has no value. When people start realizing it has no value, then the velocity of money starts kicking in and it's when we head into a hyperinflation scenario. But sorry, Rich. No, that's all right. I mean, so what you're saying is absolutely true, right? So there's, 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 a, there's a real confidence problem at the moment in the market. Um, I think one of the things where millennials and boomers and everyone else, I actually don't know the, the distinctions that well, but just say the old and the young, um, <clears throat> no one talks about the transfer of wealth that's gonna happen. Yeah. Okay, so um, it's a very under-reported um, and often overlooked aspect where, you know, if your parents or your relatives are much older than you and you're mm -hmm. going to be inheriting something, what are you going to do with that? Yeah. Have you forethought of that? Have you, how yeah. have you planned? So it was an interesting stat. I was listening to a podcast called All In. It's actually quite a good podcast. Okay. And they said that um, one-seventh of the world's wealth, mm -hmm. so one-seventh, um, is tied up with 75 million boomer Americans, mm -hmm. right? So they have some, I don't know what the exact, I think it's like seven trillion or something like that. They have some insane amount of wealth and it's adding to all the inflationary cycles that we are seeing now, right? Mm -hmm. Because let's just say, for example, you have a mum or dad or whoever it is and they've got a house which is worth two, three, four million dollars, wherever it is. Mm -hmm. They've got another half a mil to a million stocks. They've got another two, three hundred thousand in, um, in cash and they've got yeah. a, 
you know, half a million super. You're not incentivized to work. You're not mm. incentivized to go out and do things. You're incentivized to go out and chill, yeah. right? Story of my life, Red. <laughs> <laughs> and so you've got this problem where you can't get, you know, employment opportunities at the moment because yeah. everything's so tight, right? You know, you can't get, you know, people like yourselves and myself who employ people. It's really difficult to get stuff because no one wants to work for a certain amount of money. Mm. So this is people don't have confidence in the money. They don't care about the money. Yeah. Their lifestyles more important than the money because they realise that money doesn't have value. They just push a button and print more of it. Yeah, that and or you, you get the, the adage that I told you is is that you know um, tough times make uh, tough people make good, good times, times. Good times, times make soft people. people. Soft people make hard times, and then so on and so forth. Yeah. Right. Weak people, I think it is. Yeah, yeah, weak people. Right. So I think what you we're seeing is that renaissance. We're seeing that that you know that flurry just before what you said many many years ago was um uh, what was it the roaring 40s or something like that roaring 30s uh, the roaring 20s 20, and yeah the roaring 20s yeah and yeah. they had that where it was just like you know uber amounts of wealth and yeah. art and all the things that you're seeing that if you look at Sotheby's numbers yeah they've had like the biggest couple of years in the last four or five years why because it's all inflation 1930 pennies have gone up to 60 grand 65 grand yeah. lucky offers from the bullets yeah they've got some <laughs> <laughs> so all those type of thing artwork you know uh, wine, alcohol, collectibles, all these type of yeah. things have gone through the roof. Uh, cars, you know, second-hand cars. Um, <laughs> it's crazy. Because the money in and of itself has less meaning, mm -hmm. easier to get to, easier to print, it's not as difficult, right? So I think all of those things combined needs to be analysed really well, that when that transfer of wealth happens, because yeah. unfortunately no one lives forever, what's going to happen? Are those people going to value and spend the same way, or are they going to dig in and put it into well, the ground? It, it's, it's interesting, there's a... Um, there's a, an 80 year cycle that appears and it's happened throughout the centuries, right? Um, if you look at the, the money, right? I'm not talking about like the money like, uh, you know, the piece of copper that is sitting here, but like real ancient coins, right? They don't have any, right? But like denarius from like the, the ancient, um, the Roman Empire and stuff like that. Um, I forgot what I was going to say with it. The coins? I don't mind, Blake. Oh, yeah, so you have a controlled off winter, which throughout the cycles, throughout the last 2,000 years, we've seen uh, cycles that have lasted on average about 80 years where you have great levels of wealth and then it all gets sucked back out of the system. And so basically, <coughs> they're calling it now the Great Reset, right? Like mm. the World Economic Forum. And they're, of course, because they, they see that it's going to happen. They're seeing intergenerational wealth. And this is a time when you can create massive wealth because it's taking it from weak hands. I love weak hands. You're the number one person in my WhatsApp, right? Every day we're just texting, right? I'm texting you heaps of shit, like, oh, look at this person, look at this deal I got, look at this stuff. You're like, calm down, bro, stop buying, <laughs> stop buying stuff, man. And um, it's scary, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think got about fifty million worth of settlements going through at the moment. Fifty million. That's fifty million worth of shit that I'm buying personally. Yeah. And I see it, and it's like, it's just a great opportunity, right? I'm trying to build intergenerational wealth, and. You know, when you see these guys and they're talking about a great reset, it's like it's just nuking the shit that they've created and getting everyone stuck into some new Ponzi scheme. The Ponzi scheme of 100 years ago of all these poor boomers that are out there, everyone's got all the boomers, blah, blah, blah. They sacrificed their life to go and work for to buy, to buy it. Oh, they bought a $20,000 house, mm. right? A boomer, they're so lucky they bought a house for 20 grand. That means that the whole fucking life's work was for 20 grand, yeah. right? <laughs> they worked hard to pay that house off for 30 years and it ended up to be 20 grand. Mm. And now 20 grand just be printed like, oh, here you go. Everyone just said, free money, you've been flooded in, here you have some money. Your business shut down, you have another 20 grand, right? Like, said, money's in 1998, Hyundai XL was 10 grand. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so this shit, you could, and you can still buy the Hyundai XL. So that sort of value, because the dollar's been devalued so much, you can mm. pick it up. Like it's just it's nothing. So uh, looking at this this cycle, like you're right, like the 80 year cycle from the good times, the weak times, the good times. You know, um, there's a, there's a Asian proverb which is from rice fields to rice fields. It takes three generations, mm. right? One building it up, one enjoying it, the one after that doesn't know what the fuck to do. They blow it up, and the generation after that it's back in the real rice yeah. paddies again, um, and that's. You know the cycle we're in there's, there's people that are going to become very wealthy out of this and there's going to be people that are going to be you know when they say blood on the streets it's because people jump out the windows and you know that's what happened back in the 30s yeah know? absolutely yeah. yeah so i think that that's a really critical point that people need to look at and probably some of the stuff that we'll touch on a little bit later with regard to trust super funds and how you sort of can continue to protect your money but also strategically invest it's not yeah. you know all or nothing good bad buy or sell 
um, you, you need to know when to pull the trigger. Exactly. Exactly. Got my last article here, and then I'm going to end the show over to, to Red. This one here is a news.com article. Uh, it's quite a funny one. <coughs> it says here, sign the rental market is about to blow up across Australia, right? Because the people who own properties. Fucking own it. Right? It's good for people that own the properties. It's good for people that um, that own the rental businesses that manage the properties. You know, I'm the happiest fucking guy. You, you never see me this happy, have you? You're not happy. I'll give you that. <laughs> Even when shit goes wrong, I still laugh because it doesn't matter, right? It's all, as they said, what's the Wall Street? The Fugazi, the Fugazi. It's all, it's all made up, right? All this money's own all this shit. That's what you need to do. Like owning bits of credit. Imagine someone, right? Like there's all these pennies, right? A penny buys a loaf of bread. That's nothing. 20 bucks, right? You go work for an hour, get a bag of pennies, right? But back in the day, someone was working for that bag of pennies and that would take them two years. A year. A year worth of fucking money to go and get a bag of pennies, right? And now we're throwing around like fucking, you know, rolling it down the hill. See if I can... Real monopoly money. See if I can roll a penny from my office to your office. (laughs) (laughs) Down North West Boulevard. But when you look at it, you want to own the assets. The money is fake. It's all made up. It, yeah. So this article here from news.com, sign the rental market is about to blow up across Australia. The new report is put into perspective. Just how hard Aussies are being squeezed and come March, it could be more painful. So this is the 20th of October, 2022. So March, it could become a lot more painful for renters. I'm pretty sure it's because the rates come off. Yeah. I said that you, I've made it very clear that I believe that rates from March to June will start seeing reductions next year. No, I meant fixed rates. Oh, okay. Fixed yeah, rates interest. that come off. Well, I mean, the interest, interest rates interest, come down yeah. too, yeah. Um, but it will. But let's read this. Um, PropTrack's September rental report revealed that property rents nationally surged 10.3% over the last past year, with most markets recording double-digit growth. So when we think about it, just think, oh, well, where does Nathan's money come from? Fucking predominantly, it comes from his rent, right? And if it doesn't come from my rent, it comes from me managing other people's rents, right? So it's direct correlation. Uh, and I know from managing thousands of properties across the country that rents haven't just gone up by 10%, right? These are still lies again, right? The rents that we've had because they're affordable rents, there used to be like 40% of rental properties available. This is the interesting stuff. 40% of rental properties like 10 years ago were under 400 bucks a week. No oh, wow. Now it's less than 20%. And that's nationally? Caused, nationally, oh, right? Wow. And that's, that's including impressive. all the little shitty towns yeah, out there, yeah, yeah. stuff like that, right? So being able to afford rental, affordable rental accommodation, thing of the past, right? But the thing that all of our investors have been able to do over the last you know, 13 years of me doing this, or 14 years of me doing this, is they've bought good value, affordable rental accommodation, which is now, it was shit stuff back in the day, like Mount Druid, 100 grand, 150K. Now it's a million bucks to get yeah. into that market. Um, those rents are now getting squeezed and that's going to increase their cash flow. Literally, we're seeing people this year retire that might have only been doing it for two years, but they've been doing it for five or ten years and they've had a very basic strategy of buying ten properties, buying yeah. fifteen properties. And this is, you know, this is the, the bit where you tell your boss where to go. I mean, it's also, you know, proof to the pudding that you need to wait. It doesn't happen overnight. Oh, no. Yeah. How long have you been buying in Queensland? It's been about ten years. Twelve years or something. Yeah. All these people came to me years ago and go, Bertie, I bought the property last year and you bought it for me for 200 It's only worth 250 now. It was worth 250 when you bought it. We're just buying it for good value. Those things are now worth 600 right? Mm-hmm. They've tripled in value over five years, six years. Yeah, there are people that it. sold them. They go, oh, better put money in the Bitcoin. Right? Better, go, <laughs> better go buy that off the plan property, right? Yeah. And um, people expect it straight away. Like, I sent you that video last night as well, Riddles, really. that, that one with that Patrick Bet David bloke, the Iranian bloke. He's a the guy who talks about I'll, I'll send it to you again I don't mm. think you've watched it um, but he talked about the business people don't think long enough right they're thinking short term he knows when he speaks to someone about how successful they're going to be because they're looking at oh the interest rates today and all that people making stupid decisions based on something that's just in front of them today because they're yeah. so fearful of it sure. they're thinking so short term like I'm he said, I was in this video, it was a Patrick Bet David, I'll send it into the Birch feed, so if you're in Birch feed, you can watch it. It's actually, it's a really cool motivational video. And he talks about, he's Iranian, so he, he doesn't have his kids have sleepovers. If he has a sleepover, if the kids come to his house, um, when his kids grow to 30, 
and then they get married. He wants their in-laws to live there. Uh, when he holds Christmas, he wants the in-laws' parents to come over and have Christmas at his house. And that's what he's working towards. He's looking at the 20-year, 30-year time frame. And when I first started investing, I was thinking that 10-year, 20-year, 30-year, 40-year, 50-year time frame. Because I'm thinking of those my whole life. And most people are thinking very, very short hmm. term. Yeah, um, absolutely. Which I and, think and that's why you get the short term pain. Mm. You know, people sell. Yes. We've had so many clients that have come up to us, your clients, my clients, for example, who go, oh, yeah, I really shouldn't have sold last year, eh? And there was no real reason. They made 100 grand, they made 200 grand, they listened to the news, oh, the property's gone up. They've heard the real estate agent. This is the biggest thing about coming to Blink Property, right? Is that we don't sell the properties. We're not encouraging them to sell the properties. The agents are trying to get you to sell your property because they get a clip, oh, clip yeah. of it. Oh, you made 50 grand, sell the thing, right? They get another 10 grand comp, 50 mm. grand comp, whatever they And can. it's sad to see because you put a lot of time, hard work, effort into it, this team strategizing around it, and then client will say, hey, I've sold. You go, why? Oh, I wanted to do A, B, C, and D. Couldn't do it, mm. right? Mm. Because whatever, the, the intertrade environment has changed. The surfacing doesn't stack up. A whole bunch of different can't. things, right? And yeah. you just go, oh my God, why did you sell? Yeah. But once again, good times, weak times, yeah, yeah. strong hands, weak hands, and yeah, it's, it's sure. building it out. Um, so let's get back to the article. It says the Australian rental market has tightened over the uh, demic thing that was out there for the last couple of years. Uh, due to the desire for more space, the growing trend from working from home, the need for home offices, this has seen a number of people per dwelling sh fall sharply, in turn lifting rental demand despite sluggish population growth. That's not it. Right, so they're blaming the people's lifestyles. I've never seen an article to tell you this because this is what's happened, right? I've got like four houses that I live in, right? You know that, right? Mm. I remember I had two duplexes, my beach house. I fucking kick the tenant out. Like, I don't want you in my house, get the fuck out, right? I didn't do it like that, but it was like, it's my beach house now, right? Why could I go in there and say it's my beach house? Because I created wealth and the cost of money is so fucking cheap. I don't need the tenant in there to pay the rent, right? Mm. How many people have holiday houses now? How many people have yeah, vacant yeah. properties? Yeah. How many people have that? There's so much wealth that's being created in this system all to a certain thing, which has then taken other properties out. Mm. If you want to build it again, well then the cost of construction is going to go up so much. We're seeing builders go broke by the week. We're seeing them all over the news. Tilers so, are hard to come by. Tilers are hard to come by. I've got enough tilers. If anyone needs a tiler, I've got tilers. But uh, very good tilers. I, did, I told a bathroom in a whole house for two grand the other day. Yeah, right. yeah. Does the labour. The interesting something you said there was is that the the market tightened over the pandemic due to the desire for more space, the growing trend to work from home. People went to the central coast instead of the city. This has seen a number of people dwelling for sharply, uh, turn lifting their rental demand despite sluggish population growth. Now, one of the budget outcomes today will be mm -hmm. to increase the migration. Immigration. Right? Will be a little more tax. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll, give, I'll, give, I'll give you a guess. How much do you think immigration is going up? Uh, 250,000 they're talking about, but potentially 400,000. So at the moment, it's looking like it's going to go up at least 5x from where it is now. So what? So go back through that. So this is this is from the budget. So at the moment, during the pandemic and pre-pandemic, there was a tightening. Obviously, it's more conservative. It was government. like 150,000 or something, wasn't it? So at the depth of the pandemic, it's about 30,000 currently, mm -hmm. right? Per year, right? And there's a backlog of about a million, <laughs> right? Yeah. So then the natural rate of migration has got to be higher than 30,000, obviously, right? Of course. Because, yeah. So they're looking at bringing it up to at least 150 to 200,000. That's a five or six X. But I think that's where it was to start off with. Pre-pandemic. Yeah, yeah, but then they'll go up to 400,000. Maybe, right? So, yeah. But my thing is, if there's a squeeze now... <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> right? Exactly, right? I love it. And it's why there's certain times when I look at certain things, right? Like I was out there buying mining towns when everyone was pissing on them, right? People were saying, oh, don't buy the mining town. I never bought a mining town, so I thought they were shit, right? I've got a whole business model. I've got, a, I've got hundreds of millions of dollars invested in mining towns now. Literally hundreds of millions of dollars of my own money in mining towns um, because of the infrastructure there. But I was picking this shit up for my investors at pennies in the dollar. Stuff for 500 went to 50 grand and no one wanted it. You couldn't even give it away, right? Literally. And these things now have gone up a fair bit. There's a market now that's in this country. I'm not going to go into it. That's my IP. And if people that use my services to buy properties and build their wealth and stuff use that, then they get access to those type of deals. But there's areas which are very migrant sort of dense, which have been de decimated, right? Like mm. we've got capital cities which have had declines. Like there's areas in most capital cities which are, you know, gone backwards 20%, 30% mm. since 2016, which you can mm. still buy, which are very heavily migrants. But imagine when you pour all the migrants in there because yeah. they're going to go to the communities yeah. and it's going to push them up. Exciting. That's one of the fucking happiest I ever read. <laughs> Fucking happens to stay out. <laughs> I might stay out there, but that's why I just say stuff that's fun, right? Um, 
The rental supply is also likely to have been eroded through the rise of rental services like Airbnb, which has enabled property owners to pivot to the short-term rental market. No, no Airbnb worked, right? Airbnbs have turned to shit, right? Mm, I've seen struggling. all these articles of right. Airbnb. So then now they're saying it's because of Airbnb, right? Not due to the fact that everyone's got so much fucking money they're buying second or third properties to live in. Mm. I know many of my investors that have now got their investment portfolio and but they're the real one percent, right? We've created the, the new one percent, new money yeah. of one percent, right? There are the people that have ten properties, they've got them pulled a bit of equity out, mm. they bought themselves a fucking farm and a beach house. They live in the shitty city property that they've got, that there's been their dream home before. Now they've got a fucking ten acres, you know, and then they've got a beach house with like water views and shit like that. Nice. And that's where these properties are going. That's what people are doing. That's what I'm doing. That's mm. what I do. That's what, they're all, I encourage everyone to do. I've got mates doing it too. you got 400 <laughs> acres. <laughs> in Sydney. <laughs> um, uh, what do we got here? Rental supply has been eroded through the Airbnb. Absolutely not. The later trend may have been particularly prevalent in tourism destinations across Australia, some of which have boomed alongside des- domestic tourism over the past few years. I don't know, I've only been in the tourism business for two years, right? <laughs> I came from nowhere. But I saw the opportunity there. But um, the short-term rental market, like, hey, that ain't where it's gone to, right? There's all these people have gone in and they've, uh, some areas have been for mining. So there's a lot of fly and fly out. So companies have had to go rent all the properties in the area for mining. So mm-hmm. the locals miss out. Yeah. They're paying 200 bucks a week and they're paying 800 bucks a week. Poor bastards. Not They're even mining, just infrastructure. Everything. Infrastructure. Um, freeway, all these things that are coming out of the budget, of course, is to occur. Mm. Um, record immigration is disaster for the rental market. <laughs> if you're a tenant, but if you're one of our investors, happy days, right? Um, I've had a really bad fear that I publish this to a different page. I always get scared, right? I get scared with where I publish this because it goes out to multiple different channels. I always get scared that I'm going to post it to a, a Chinese restaurant of mine or to a motel. <laughs> but uh, there's one that's full of tenants in there, so I'm worried that they're going to watch it and go, fuck, this guy's off his head Sweet. to talk about it. You just put them all over the paper for it. Um, record immigration is a disaster for the rental market. The working from home phenomenon. So now it's gone from it literally. This is like fucking one three article. paragraphs from one article. It's gone from um, the pandemic for more space, then to Airbnbs eroded the market, and now it's gone to a working from home. Now it's gone to immigration. Uh, what is it? Why is the market gone up? Is all this stuff? Is it fucking Russia and Ukraine? Is it because I caught climate change? Right? <laughs> Right? What is it? All the news is coming out with just junk, right? No one gives an exact answer. And the exact answer is in the numbers, right? Because when you overlay the currency being printed, the ability for people to afford things, right? There's so many people out there with so much money. It's all fake money anyway, but they've been able to take all the assets off the table. Except one place, Nath, the wages. wages Don't worry about the wages. Wages have moved. They have, they've started to go up. But it doesn't matter, who needs a wager? Some money's gone, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Good time. Look at this, the net overseas migration. Like, it's we're now hitting to like the sharpest points. So here we go. It says here, um, the highest level in March quarter with tw- 96,000 um, migrants. So on average, yeah, it's about 200,000 a year that come through prior. But now we're seeing 100,000 a quarter. That's four, it's on track for 400,000 mm. people a year. Where are we going to place these people? Where the fuck are they going to go? It's great. Um, <laughs> smaller rooms, right? Motels. <laughs> you can't afford your house, come to my motel. Yeah, I'll have an abundance of tenants for there, don't worry. Um, monthly student visa applications, the first half of 22 exceeded pre scandemic levels with the analysis of high frequency visa data by. Cooler Bar Capital. <laughs> and they cool the bar capital. It's an uh, AMP. Is it? Okay. Right, man. It sounds like the pub or something. There's a pub called that down the road. Um, oh, no, the screen's on. It's just pop ups at hop. Stuff always pops up on the screen. Um, shows that international student arrivals rocketed to $500,000 on an annualized okay. basis in the September quarter with the work visas also accelerating. That's going to. Imagine when we start seeing all the wages, you know, what's that going to do for wages when you've got to, when we're dumping all of these new, you know, skilled workers. People Unemployment, that my friend. Unemployment line straight out the door. <laughs> I'm always hiring guys who've got like 50 jobs going, so if anyone's looking for a job, hit me up. Um, the, the rapid acceleration of uh, student visas 
follows the former Morrison government's removal of the cap of the number of hours students can work while studying late last year, alongside the granting of two-year post-study work rights from vocational education. Um, the Albus Leesy government then used that last month's Jobs and Skills Summit to announce that it would deliver record immigration next year via raising the permanent of non-humanitarian migrant by yeah, 30,000 to a high 195, so it's gone up from 150 to 200,000, mm -hmm. accelerating temporary migration from expanding work rights for international students by uncapping the number of hours international students can work while studying. Wow, so we're going to have international students that work in 40 hour weeks, not 20. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. Committing to clear the backlog of nearly 1 million visas awaiting approval. Wow, we all know one person needs to get their visa late. <laughs> A scary thought. Um, the Department of Home Affairs has already ruled out by one, more than one more than two million temporary and permanent visa applications for the last four months. Yet there's still a backlog of eight hundred and seventy two thousand because the applications continue to pour in, which the government has vowed to clear as quickly as possible. Crazy times. Crazy times. Mm, look, I think it's interesting, it's always good from uh, <clears throat> an overall macro level to understand these things so that way you know that when you are investing it's not short term yeah, the I government's not thinking short term the visa policies the migration policy is not short term so you've got to be long term you've got to look at it how it's all going to feed into ultimately you know some financial independence away from work and you know depending on what you want to do how it's how it's going to benefit you yeah well, well I'm going to leave it with you to talk about a few things. I'm going to hop on my phone. I'm going to get some budget topics that have come out in the last 10 minutes or so since we've sure. been talking. Um, but, you know, we talk about lots of things regularly and a lot of people might be saying, oh, how do I cut my tax bill and stuff like that, right? Like any accountant can help you cut tax and all that. But planning for wealth creation, planning for the long game, right? We're talking about the long game. How do investors plan for the long game? Are they working for the next five years? Are they working for the next 10 years? There's an accumulation cycle. There's a consolidation phase. Um, how are they going to get that that wealth to, to, to look after themselves for you know mm. retirement? What sort of vehicles for intergenerational wealth? What sort of, you know, when you look at these, uh, there was a, a few articles, they touched on it briefly, like talking about the lizard lady and the son, Charles, or whatever his mm. name is, yeah. talking about, you know, the queen, is they're outraged that she doesn't have to pay taxes and stuff and there's special vehicles that people have to you know have intergenerational wealth and we can't go through it all today and there's no uh, taxation advice that's coming from Ridge it's going to talk general stuff but maybe we can start on some of the topics that you got in the different types of yeah. structures and look all that. it's it's important it's one of those things that we get I ask probably every week um, at least two or three clients will call up and say, hey, is it time for a trust or should I buy in a trust or what's the benefits and disbenefits of a trust? Now, in my humble opinion, and I share this with Nathan all the time, I think in the property space, trusts are over-prescribed, over mm -hmm. as being the saviour to all the world's problems. Um, trusts, in my opinion, have a really good time and place um, and a genuine position within the property and investing space. Um, I don't think, however, it should be something that prevents you from actually going off and investing, right? So a lot of clients kind of, I think, get a little bit paralytic about how they want to invest and, and they think that, you know, the trust is going to solve all the problems, what Nate was saying, you know, tax, any sort of asset protection, all these other different things. So again, that it has a time and a place and it also needs to be overlaid with what you need out of it, right? So I always use the same adage, and you've probably heard it here before, is that we can give you the same trust structures as James Packer, as Nathan Birch, as, you know, it's really complex. Um, does it help you or me, the average person, to be able to buy and have properties which allow us to have some financial independence away from work and all those other type of things that we're investing for? Um, it can, but to be honest with you, you probably have so much headache and so much administration that it becomes a problem. It's kind of like what I tell our clients and I've told Nathan heaps of times, I actually don't understand why clients manage, self-manage properties, um, you know, their payment structures, council rates, all that type of stuff. You're better off getting the agent to do it, right? Of course. Because if you have 10 properties, and that means you've got four council rates, four strata rates, four water bills, 12 monthly interest payments, repairs mm -hmm. and all that stuff is coming to you, it becomes admin. And it means is that you're less likely to engage with the process of property ownership and you become more and more frustrated, right? And we see that all the time when people come to do their tax and they've got pieces of stuff everywhere. When, when we do our tax and we get clients who are you know organized to do their tax, they've got three pieces of paperwork agent report, interest report from the bank, mm -hmm. and insurance. Mm 
Mm -hmm. That's it. So per property, you got three. You got three things, and sometimes you get the agent to pay the insurance. So it's two, yeah. right? Um, and de depreciation reports are held on file. So you know you can have forty properties with managing about fifty pieces of paper, right? Um, so it, it's one of those things where you know you, you don't really have to be um, tied up and and weighed down by you know admin and structures. So there's a couple of different types of trusts, um, and the most common one that people often talk about are family trusts, mm -hmm. um, and family trusts. Uh, actually slash discretionary trusts. There's a, there's a different type of family trust election that occurs to allow families to be able to enact some of the family trust election rules. Uh, but a discretionary trust in, in nature is one where the trustees, the people governing the trust, have the authority or the ability to be able to direct um, the, the income of the trust towards the beneficiaries. Uh, generally in a family trust, those beneficiaries are named blood, children, mums, dads, you know, those type of things. Um, or it's all relatives and families whom you can effectively quote unquote trust. Mm -hmm. Now there have been some changes with regard to how that works under section 100A. It's a bit of a boring topic, but you just need to be a little bit more strategic about how your trust is set up and how you distribute, especially to your children. Um, <clears throat> but what it means is, is that you can have an asset, and I always tell clients is, is that, what type of asset do you have? And they can, if you had a negative geared property, which you're always pulling out equity from, mm -hmm. and you never intend to sell, mm -hmm. would you stick it in the trust? Of course not, because then all your taxes stuck in the trust. Stuck and in the trust. Uh, uh, there's a time and place of which properties. I get asked this question every day of the week, and I never give tax advice, but you know we talk about you know hypothetical scenarios and looking at um, you know putting in a trust. I see so many people come and they've been to an accountant that tries to sell them a trust. I've seen them or a property, a property, right? And all these schemes, they get all their fingers in the pie and they you know sell these certain things. I've seen people that have come up with like a block of land in a trust in New South Wales, right? Yeah. For those of you that may not be aware, in New South Wales, you don't pay land tax up until $750,000. So the land was like 500 grand. It was in a trust. It was a husband and a wife. They could literally own 750K of land in one name and 750 on the other. It's $1.5 million worth of land holding and not pay any land tax. This property was negative geared like 25 grand a year. It was being slugged with um, with land, tax. land tax and you couldn't claim any offset against anything it was trapped within the trust there's you know I was like whoever I can talk from two minutes of talking to someone whoever gave them certain advice whether it be from their accountant or from their financial planner or whether it be from their um, finance person they're either really fucking stupid or they're a criminal and they're giving dud advice that pop behind mm. their own pockets and that's yeah. <clears throat> yeah. we get we get clients because of Nathan we get clients and because we, you know we, we work there, we get clients from other Groups, and there's nothing to say bad about any other groups, but I've seen a lady, lovely lady, um, she came with, um, she came to us to do her work, mm -hmm. and she had three properties, mm -hmm. <laughs> three trusts, right? And each one of them were operating or engaging with those properties, and her compliance bills was like six thousand, seven thousand dollars, right? So well, she had, the accountant that was doing it, but it was all from a particular buyer's agent, and you know, and I was just, I was really upset for her, and we, and I said to clients all the time. We grow when you grow. We won't load you up with structures just to send you bills. Mm -hmm. We want you to get more properties, and that's the way we, you know, increase and and and, and grow with you, right? Mm. So a discretionary trust is useful if you have a couple of different things. If you have a big capital gain that you know is coming, revaluation, rezoning, redevelopment opportunities, mm -hmm. um, a land bank which you've done a couple of times in terms of larger deals, for example, mm -hmm. um, and you've got clear cash flow positive properties mm -hmm. under current interest rate risks measured yeah. up, and they're all done. And you've got, and this is a really critical one, you've got people to distribute to. Yeah. Some people have a trust and they're the only beneficiary. Yeah. So you're putting you're putting a wall between you and your own assets. <laughs> it's like locking your money in your pocket. pocket yeah. It's like those phone cases which lock them in at the dinner table. You know, where they have the, the phone case and you put it inside the... No, I'm saying it. Or you, like, you, you put a little timer, it's like a cage oh, you put on the table. And you, it's like a safe and yeah. it won't open until like a, an hour yeah. or whatever you set it for so no one can touch their, yeah, dinner, nice. their phone at the dinner table we'll and stuff. It's like, why would you have your phone in your pocket? Why would you have your money in your pocket and you go, I'm going to lock it in the safe and never yeah. to touch it. It's, it's so you've got to have advice. all these strategic things. Now, that's not to say that if you've got a high-risk job, you've got a lot of different you know, targets on your back, then you think a trust is suitable for you. No problems, right? But again, it's horses for courses and it has to fit. It, it, it all has to work and it all has to fit nicely, right? So trusts are important to be able to have a part of your overall investing environment. So Nathan, for example, myself, for example, properties in our own names, super funds, trusts, companies sometimes, yep. depending on what it is, right? 
but it's not the case where you buy, you have a trust, you've gone off to a seminar, trust, 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 everything goes in a trust, right? I, I don't think that advice is sound, nor do I think that's fair, right? So I have a quick little um, uh, diagram here that I send off to clients when setting up a trust, and I really apologize if it's poor. We, um, we can't, so just for everyone that's watching, we can't put a slide deck on it. It's not like a webinar. Yeah. Um, we can have a slide deck. It's it's. Uh, Facebook doesn't allow that, but maybe I can hold it. You can you can talk through it. I'll hold it. So maybe people want to screenshot yeah, it or so something. Yeah. So you've got, for example, you've got here, which is um, the discretionary family trust here, and that owns a whole bunch of different assets and types of entities. Now this one was set up for a client when we were doing pretty early on in the piece. To be honest with you, cryptocurrencies, right? So a lot of guys were having crypto in their own name, selling it short term, getting taxed with a full whack of you know forty seven percent. So we were setting these entities up owned by a discretionary trust so that if they did make gains in cryptocurrencies long term or short term, they had the ability to stream it out to their family members, right? At the same time, that trust can actually own properties, right? So it's a vehicle or a central point from which you branch out, right? So it's really useful because you've got, you know, businesses you can have, you can have shared, you can have shares just on the listed stock exchange, you can have property, you can have commercial property, you can do a whole bunch of different things with it, right? Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, if you have this type of architecture, there is some administration, there is things that you need to put on top of that. Yeah. Um, so you just need to know where you fit into the piece. Now again, if this property here is negatively geared, then it's stuck at this level, it can't come out to the beneficiaries. Yeah. If it's positively geared, then beautiful, we can stream it out, right? Yeah. So it's important to understand where you want to go. It's mm -hmm. important to understand what you're trying to do. So for example, um, a, a lot of our complex clients, they might have a trust which owns a property, but that property, is commercial so mm -hmm. there's another business which is actually leasing that property from the trust right i have a, a for example i had a client today who's got a petrol pump the petrol pump is a high risk business you know you've mm -hmm. got fire you've got fuel you've got you know theft mm -hmm. and all that type of stuff but the property is actually where the money is right yeah that petrol pump just cash flows that property and so we have this petrol pump set up with the land and the dirt is owned in a trust and he's got another company which overlays and runs it right mm. So it's really important to understand that either can benefit you, should you do it, come and speak to us. Don't just go off and say, yes, I've seen this online or I've seen this at a seminar, I need all these six trusts. I've heard the lady yeah. with the with the naggy voice at, at a seminar. <laughs> the people <laughs> will know who that person is. You probably know who that person is. I can't say anything. I can't say anything. <laughs> But um, that it encourages people to go and get so many. There's, there's a there's a few of them, and they're they're very they're very um, glossy, like they're very showy. Yeah, like their yeah. their webinars are great, their presentations are great. They're not rough. They're yeah. not like me going yeah. fuck, you know. And whatever. look, when you go to those seminars, there's people there that are typing and setting up and doing trust yeah. for you right there. That's a real problem, right? So I think <laughs> this is really I've never I've never been yeah, to no, seminar. Yeah, it's crazy. Wow, crazy. Um, <clears throat> so I think you need to be uh, aware that you know. When you, when you speak trusts, make sure that it benefits you, right? Mm -hmm. Now it is important because if you have mm -hmm. an asset you don't want anyone to touch, because yeah. you might have your children who are married to difficult personalities and all these other things, or you and you know your overall family have a little bit of targeting on your back, then you can have a property, and this is where Nathan's intergenerational comes in, is stuck in a trust, and you can have that trust controlled into some extent beyond your grave as well, that's testamentary in nature, mm -hmm. um, where you can say, well, Nathan has this property and then he wants it to be sold at the last living descendants, last third grandchild or whatever it might be, right? Yeah. So a really long time, obviously trusts run 80 years and there's a few resettlement rules that are in there that we have to navigate, but you can have a go for a really long time. And so that means is that you have things which become intergenerational. So if you've got a really powerful property which is providing you hundreds of thousand dollars a year in positive income mm -hmm. and you want your kids, but you don't want your kids' partners to be able to sue them and divorce yeah. them or whatever it is and take that, then you can stick it in a trust, right? Yeah. So again, discretionary trust is the most common. We have unit trust as well, um, you know, both. Bloodline trust? Discretion is kind of like a bloodline trust, okay. right? So it follows what, you know, who's in yeah. your bloodline and who you name, right? Yeah. Um, so effectively cordons off to you and your family. Um, a unit trust is a really common one, um, underrated piece of um, trust, um, you know, law as well, I think in some regards. Um, a unit trust gives you some of the benefits of having a trust, 
but you unitize that trust, meaning that you actually own directly a part of it, right? Yeah. So if you're getting into a business with someone or if you're buying a property, for example, you might do a JV between you and your super fund. A unit trust is a really good scenario to be able to and structure to be able to navigate that process. We can transfer trust between unit holders. Um, you know, you can over time buy units uh, your super fund can buy units from you your business can buy units from you so you can basically harvest all the different powers of cash that you have stick it all in your unit trust and over time transfer the ownership there is some tax and other bits and pieces along the way to pay but it's actually easier than you know having to do a hard sell or hard buy with regard to, to those properties so it is really useful for clients to consider the importance of the structure but in my biggest advice is the applicability of it right yeah so Nathan and I probably say no to trust more than we say yes, yeah. I reckon, to be honest with you. Um, but again, if you're looking at some you know, really critical piece of infrastructure, a land bank, a big development, you know, those type of big capital gains, windfalls that occur, um, yeah. you, you'd be in a position where you can do that, right? So that there is the basic architecture of a trust. Um, so it's probably a little bit simpler than the last one. So, so you've basically got, um, you've got the trust here. Um, you've got a corporate trustee, which is what we always recommend. So in the event of your death, you don't actually have to then resettle this trust by appointing new appointors or trustees. It owns a property, for example. <clears throat> that property rent goes to the bank account, which is owned by the trust, and it goes out to different beneficiaries. Now, here is a really critical one, right? Often overlooked, um, used more and more, we've been doing it for many years, is a corporate beneficiary, right? So a corporate beneficiary means that you can cap that tax to 30%. It doesn't matter yeah. how much income that, that trust earns, you stick it all in the corporate beneficiary, it becomes your bank. Is it Just 30% like, or a 27.5 so, now? Uh, no, a passive company is still 30%, but there is legislation that might see it all come down to 25%. We don't know yet. But this bank, uh, this, this corporate beneficiary can actually become your bank, which you've done over the years, right? You've got money parked up and you've got money sitting into an account and you can't do anything with it, so you start to have engagement and borrowing profiles with that company, right? So yeah. it is something useful, and this, this entity here starts to replace what would be a third party lender to you and to your entities, right? So if you've got enough of the money in there, or you can reloan it to the trust, or you can go off and buy a property, for example. Yeah. You know, in, in its own name, right? So it's one of those things where if you want to um, consider where to invest, how to invest, you know, come and speak to Nathan, come and speak to myself. Um, it's not a salesy thing. You know, we really only provide trust when they're needed, in my opinion, and sort of just in time. Yeah. And. And then looking at, um, so we've talked about like trust. What about super funds, right? Like, yeah, so super funds are a type of trust. Yeah. Right, so the same premise where it's on trust for a particular beneficiary. So um, just breaking it down, right? I'm just going to dumb things down like real simple to people. Um, a lot of people don't realize that they can actually buy properties with a super, hmm. right? Very easy. And uh, we've got clients, I spoke to one client yesterday. We bought three properties today in super. Two are locked in, one I just need to double check. But um, looking at super, people sit there and go, okay, I've got, like if I asked the average person, right, just if there was a poll um, that, um, <laughs> so it's ready, the phone jails are selling us Chris Kringles. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I mean. Well, the, the Christmas present, you hand them out at Christmas oh. time, they're like, <laughs> they're like a little nobody. Um, so, Looking at um, uh, the question I ask people is like, how much money do you have in your super? Right? People don't even know. They go, oh, I think I've got like 200 grand. I might have 100 grand, might have 50 grand. That is your money. Mm. Right? And people don't realize that they have ability. People come and say, oh, well, I'm screwed. I can't do anything. Oh, I can't service. Just had a kid, one, one income, whatever the case might be. I can't service. But they don't realize that they've got another entity that they can service. And just like you were saying there. And um, you know, some people can buy one property, some people can buy five properties, right? And we can't give that advice because we're not financial advisors in that front. Um, but inside of that super fund, if someone had 200 grand or 300 grand um, in their super and they were to roll it over and do certain things with it, uh, I've seen lots of people that have, you know, they might have 300 grand, 200 grand, it's losing 
you know, people say the most common thing people say is, I think I had 200, now it's 150 or 180, right? It's gone backwards and I've lost money. But I've seen people take their money and they go, okay, I've got 200 grand. I can use it as a deposit. I can go get another 600 grand worth of borrowing. Mm. I can buy 800 grand worth of property and go buy a few properties with that. Um, the ability is is there to borrow from in a super fund and, and all that sort of stuff. But we can't give you advice on that because really it's a, um, an accountant, an accountant not an advisor. Not an advisor. Um, I've never, you know, I see all the advisors out there in the marketplace and the advice that gets given is very um, bad because they're trying to sell them whatever product. So financial advisors get paid commissions for selling shares and for selling insurances. Uh, our parents tell us when we're kids, right, don't trust the used car salesperson, don't trust the insurance salesperson, but be the insurance salesperson, you need to be a financial <laughs> advisor, right? Yeah, majority so, of the time, yeah. Exactly. So you can't, we can't sit here and sell you insurance. You have to be a financial planner. These are the same people that give you your advice. So there's only a handful of people that I, I trust and read trust when it comes to planning and strategy because I think everyone should be their own financial planner and fi own financial uh, advisor mm. and the way to know that is to learn. We've self-taught ourselves about mm. all these things and um, we encourage other people to do so. But on that note, like just in a simplistic format from an accountancy perspective on how people set it up, what would be the way someone goes, I want to go set up a self-managed super fund today. Obviously, they've got their advice, they know what they're doing, all that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, what would be the, how does it work? So let's just skip the part of, are you eligible to set up? Let's assume that you are, in this yeah. hypothetical, right? Yeah. There's so, lots of personal, so just a little, little disclaimer I've touched on beforehand. In case the financial regulators are watching, hi, hope you're doing well, <laughs> wish you well for your family, just don't talk to us and we prefer that you don't talk and, and have conversation with us, but if, if they are, none of this is financial advice. Everyone should go get their own financial advice. Um, don't constitute it as financial advice. Um, this is just general chit chat. Um, some people may not be eligible. Um, some people say you need to have 200 grand to get into a super fund. Some people might set it up with 100 grand. I've seen people set up a super fund with 50 grand. If someone came to Ridwine and said, hey, I've got 50 grand, I want to set up a super fund, uh, you'd have to be a very interesting conversation to be having that. You would be, it wouldn't be advisable to do so. So there is barriers of entry. It's important yeah. to get your guidance yeah. on that. And, and that's the fundamental truth, right? So again, the same way we don't load up clients with structures for the sake of billing, no one should be loading up clients with super funds just for the sake of fund management or you know purchasing property, etc. Right. So it's got to, it's illogical as well. And I think some in some ways it's architectured well. You need a certain amount of cash to be able to buy any property with lending, right? Mm -hmm. You know because super funds are a little bit more hungry and thirsty when it comes to lending, 30, 40 percent sometimes. So even if you want to buy two or three hundred thousand dollar property, if you've got twenty or thirty grand, and I get asked every week, you know, should I set up a super fund? The short answer is no, right? Now, let's assume that you qualify on all the other basis is that you, you can set up a super fund, you've got a couple of hundred grand in there, financial plan and everything has said yes, right? Um, this person is good. How does it work? So basically your fund at the moment is, is not managed by you, right? So you've got your own personal superannuation company. So a retail super fund is, is what they're referred to. So Australian Super, Host Plus, you know, the whole thing that on the ads, all that type of stuff. And to be honest and fair- You should have a logo for those ones, right? <laughs> They've got their hands, but they're in a different single <laughs> symbol, right? They're not like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> To Nathan doesn't love them. I actually think to some extent they do okay, right? Because they've returned okay results over the years. Um, but we're not here for okay in life, right? Like if you're a mediocre, yeah, you don't yeah. know what you're doing. I'm with you. I'm Some with people, you. I'm people with shouldn't you own a business, right? Lots of people should be an employee. Yeah. Better off. Lots of people shouldn't get into investing in property because it's probably not best. Lots of people shouldn't be touching the super fund because they're stupid, right? There's a lot of people out there that see it and go, well, that's, I'm getting robbed. It's like, yeah. it's, it's, And yeah. I think that level of control, that level of quote unquote self-management, if you have that passion, you have that drive, you have that ability, then it is something and is the reason why it exists, right? Yeah. It's literally called a self-managed super fund. Mm. That being said, if you haven't got time for it, you're better off, you get frightened by you know investing and whatnot, you're better off leaving it to just so it invests. The worst thing we've ever seen is, is that for years and years and years and years, 10, 15 years, clients just have a super fund set up, it's in cash and does nothing. It's just it's a waste, or, right? Or people go to a, an event on the weekend, yeah. they start investing in the crypto. Yeah, yeah, yeah all that crazy stuff. Crazy process stuff. is just mental, right? There is actually a very big need for those regulators, like, there's no, so many yeah, dodgy people So many around. dodgy people, so many dodgy there, people. Right? Like, and, and it's really, and we, to be honest, we shut down a lot of supers because they're not appropriate, right? And we've seen, unfortunately, people lose a lot of money 
in that in that scammy crypto and all that other type of space. But mm. just so we keep it, you know, nice and breezy, let's say that you qualify. Mm-hmm. Financial planner says yes, you can set it up. Yeah. How does it work now? So your retail super is currently doing investment management, insurances for you, um, reporting for you, and they're doing effectively all the compliance work for you, right? Mm-hmm. Communicating with the government on what your um, super guarantee contributions are. All that heavy lifting comes across to you, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So we assist with that type of thing. In terms of the accounting, we do the reporting. But how it fundamentally works is, is that you would go off and you would have a self-managed super fund trust, right? So you'd actually have what is you know the red in this scenario so I'll here, hold it up right? And you... So the red, where's that pen go now? Uh, I've yeah. been playing with it. Yeah. So that red here is a self-managed super fund. Now that is basically a trust fund, but it's governed by the CIS Act, and it tells the the overall administrators or the overall trustees what this can do. Now in this particular scenario here, this is a bear trust arrangement. I'll go through it. The super fund is prohibited; cannot lend cannot engage in lending, right? So what happens here is is that the bear trust engages on behalf of the super fund, the lending, and it goes off and buys this property. To make it more simple, out here was your Australian super, you rolled it in and you had everything now in your self-managed super fund. Attached to this is a bank account, Macquarie Bank, CBA, whoever you want to use, for example. Mm -hmm. That's now the basic or the core premise of your super fund you can then use that super fund to go off and set up a Comsec account, go off and set up, you know, for example, a share trading account for international shares, or you can go off and you can buy property directly. You might not need this, for example, if you've got enough cash in there, um, but you could also go and engage a lender and say, hey, I've got 100 grand, I wanna buy this property, which is 300 grand, and all the rents and all the activities all go back to the super, and all the expenses which come out of that property, council water, strata, insurance, repairs and maintenance, all get paid for it. At the end of the day, you might have a positive or a negative. Let's say you have a positive, 5,000, that sits in the Superfund bank account, and this property does its own thing, right? So you can basically harness the power of your Superfund and the cash that's in there to be able to commit to an investing profile within the Superfund. Should you do it, it's not my job or Nathan's job, it's a job of the financial planner whom we put you in touch with um, to make sure that it is the correct and the most appropriate for you to do. Now again, you can say, well, I back or I like property or I trust property more than shares. That's a conversation between you and the financial planner and to make the determination that yes, I want to commit to the super fund. Mm. How and why it works well is the same inside of a self-manage and outside of self-manage. They work, they work well because Super funds are taxed as a low tax environment, so 15% on income and 10% on a discounted capital gains basis. And in um, pension phase or retirement, there's no tax, right? So people run off to the British Virgin Islands and Panama and all these other places to get no tax. But if you park a million dollars in a property, in assets, in super, retail or self-managed, in your retirement, if that matures to $2 million, you don't pay any tax on that, right? So that's really powerful, right? Um, and it's important that you understand how the super fund works because the, the last thing that anyone wants, um, including myself and Nathan, is is that the super fund isn't used appropriately, right? Yeah. So it's you know it's 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 wasted on crypto, it's wasted on things that you don't understand, or you take a punt. I've got clients who have unfortunately bought you know artwork and stuff which they haven't been able to recoup, and we just don't recommend it. We think that We're if you invested you're, in the people's property funds, which are properties, businesses, yeah. whole bunch of different stuff, right? It's it's all crazy, right? So. I think if you're in a position where you can, you know, you utilize the power of the super fund, and it's all been, you know, given the um, the okay by the financial planner, um, mm-hmm. and whatever their recommendations are, um, mm-hmm. it, it can be useful for you, right? So, you know, and a lot of people forget that if you're a business owner, like Nathan's office here, for example, um, it can be owned in the super fund, and you can engage and use it and pay rent to it meaningfully, right? And so you're actually then utilizing or harvesting your own, you know. Um, uh, stock to be able to benefit yourself, right? So, <clears throat> what are the latest updates? Is one of the points I had. Um, <clears throat> over the years, the super fund and the self managed super fund world have compressed, and that compression is because of compliance. Um, so, there's been a change in 2016, 2015, um, with the way the super funds are set up, how they're navigated, who can set them up. And I think it's all for the, the best, to be honest with you, because it's really good that you know they have the governance in place. Um, however, there is probably a silver 
um, I shouldn't say silver lining, it's probably a dark cloud which actually sits over the top of it, and that is a super fund lobby, right? So the, the retail super funds, your Australian supers, REST and whatnot, I genuinely think they're really good at what they do, and I think that, you know, they should be given credit because they have done really well, but they also have some self-interest like everyone does. So the more money that runs out of those retail funds into self-manage means yeah. there's less, less fund, liquidity. FUM, so funds under management, less liquidity and less ways for them to utilize their services to charge and perform fees and services, which again, I'm okay with because they've been doing well, but they're protecting their little world, right? So there's been a lot of pressure on the government and now we've got a labor government, which is all good and there's no issues with that at all. Um, is that they'll be more receptive to that fact and say, okay, well, you know, are the super funds which are self-managed being governed correctly? Are they being navigated correctly? Um, and you might find that potentially not in tonight's mini budget, but in the May budget, there might be a rule which suggests that super funds will either be prohibited from lending mm -hmm. or they'll be grandfathered to a point. So existing super funds with existing loans, that'll be the last of it. Mm -hmm. And they might wind this up. And that for me, I think is coming from direct pressure from the super funds because they're seeing more and more and more money. It's slowed down a lot, but they're still seeing on a protracted basis that there they're is money, smaller. they're getting smaller, right? Um, yeah. And obviously with last year's superannuation review um, that came out and, and the government sort of naming and shaming those who are poor, mm -hmm. unfortunately, although they're doing the right thing because they're aggregating the money to the best providers, the power that those you know named providers have now, yeah. uh, it's, it's just astronomical, right? And so they can make those lobbies to the government and say, well, hey, what's happening here we're losing you know two three four five hundred thousand every hour in rollouts we need to keep that back and so i think again whilst they're good and i think they really serve a, a quite a large portion i think it needs to be checked and balanced right are they doing it for their own self-interest or the betterment of the members right so i think that's yet to be seen and yet to be tested um but yeah if you if you do think self-managed super fund is something that you're interested in contact uh, nathan's office they'll put you in touch with the financial planners and then they'll come back uh, to an eventual meeting with us um, and we can run you through and see whether or not there's anything we can do. Yeah, I think it's it's a very good vehicle, not for everyone, but very, very uh, good. And I think that it's a, 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 a vehicle that's used by a few and a few that use it very well. Like mm. if you think about it, you're paying 30% tax, 40% tax, all that sort of shit people pay. What's the tax rate in your super fund? 15. 15%. What about when you retired? Zero. Zero percent <coughs> interest. Yeah. 0% tax. Tax, tax, tax sorry, yeah. tax, sorry. Yeah. Um, so looking at... Um, That's actually a good question by Johnny McSquirt. <laughs> yeah, you asked the question. And yeah. Answered, yeah. Would you agree that the trust making a profit will help you in serviceability is tight? Now, um, it's an interesting question and depends lender to lender. Uh, theoretically, additional distributions from a discretionary trust can be added, in this, added into the servicing pool from what we've seen. However, it is dependent on the, the actual subject of what's in the trust. If it's real property, for example, potentially. If it's a business, there might be more questionable. If it's one-off capital gains, definitely not. So there's a few different things um, that you need to be, um, I, I don't think you can solely rely on that. Definitely good to speak to your broker whether or not the trust profit or serviceability can actually act uh, and in, in unison with your own servicing requirements. We're meant to talk about the budget now, Reed. Let's quickly do it. No, let's. You let's got do, no, I've got some. I've been looking up some news articles here on the side, right? Yeah, sure. So I'm just going to read through this one. I just, uh, I just went on news.com for some reason. I just. That's the worst place, by the way. It is worst, but it's like, it's it's just it's comical. It's like people are getting dumbed down with it's yeah, radio or whatever. It's like the Kardashians yeah. and yeah, yeah. you know all that sort of stuff. That. So the first article here says the biggest and winners losers explain. Oh no, that's the that's the. Wait. Let's go back two seconds. I had I sent it the Birch feed um, a minute, uh, 10, 15 minutes ago. It says here the treasurer's nightmare scenario in the budget. Right? Hard landing. The federal budget documents warn of nightmare scenario as global shocks take their toll. Right? This was the first article that got posted on that. The budget papers warn of the risk posed by a succession of major shocks around the world and highlight one awful possibility. The federal budget papers lay bare the extent to a succession of major and interrelated shocks, including Russia's invasion of Ukraine, right? <laughs> Come on, I use that as an excuse all the time, right? <laughs> We've been caught up in Russia and Ukraine, I can't pay my taxes, right? Whatever, <laughs> they're using it for everything. Um, have 
wrought havoc through the global economy with the grim consequences looming on both overseas and back in Australia. This is a time of great challenge and change, Treasurer from Jim Chalmers acknowledged in the speech. The global economy teeters on the, again on the edge of a war which isn't ending, the, the global energy crisis which is en escalating. When you think about energy crisis, we've got all the fucking resources in this ground of this country for us to be able to um, you know, pull ourselves through it. So, um, uh, what was the other thing? Um, the war there's an energy crisis, inflationary pressures and economy slowing. While the, we intend to avoid the worst of the turbulence from overseas, we cannot escape a completely global challenge. It's blame something else, right? Follow, we're gonna blow up here, mm. right? Uh, along with high inflation, high interest rates will have an impact. This warning is reflected in the Treasury's forecast, which show the global economic situation has worsened significantly in virtually every key metric since pre-electric economic fiscal outlook. Uh, was published back in March, right? So the last six months, we're in a recession, right? He's saying we're in a recession without saying he's in a recession. The global economic environment is sharply deteriorated. High inflation is sapping momentum and global growth is slowing more than expected uh, with some major economies stalling or contracting. High global interest rates have increased the risk of recession across major advanced economies and the outlook for China has weakened. As such, Treasury has downgraded its global forecast by 75 basis points or 0.75% um, in 2022 and 1% in 2023. Um, more formidable challenge than expected. Inflation is a worldwide problem and is ex being exacerbated by both the after effects of the um, illness thing, uh, particularly by continuing lockdowns in China. The Russian invasion in Ukraine has disrupted the global energy supply. No one has it. We've got the shit in the ground. Why is it global, right? Like, why can't we pull it out of the ground, right? This stuff that they, uh, gas prices are a key source, intensifying cost of living pressures. Many consumers having risen over sixfold since March 21, right? Sixfold. Mm. It's risen sixfold. It's going to go up by 8% over the next two quarters. Imagine owning stuff in mining areas, eh? <laughs> you picked it up for nothing. Inflation will be going through the roof there. <laughs> Those white utes Toyota sold need to go somewhere, right? The builders have gone broke. Right, we need to go and push that Ponzi scheme to somewhere else, mm -hmm. right? Let's reinflate those bubbles, right? Um, food prices remain elevated, driven by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. All this inflation had occurred before February 2022, right? They're now blaming, they've shifted, it was Corona, it was China, it was fucking and guy eating a bat, it was everything, and now it's fucking Russia, it's Putin's fault that we have inflation. Not one bit of it here says, we robbed the fucking world, we printed so much fucking money that was cheap, uh, we've we've devalued the currency at massive levels, your money doesn't buy you shit, we've stolen from you. At no point does it show any of this stuff, right? That's the part that really gets me fired up. I find it humorous because I can see it. I can fucking, I'm like Neo that's blind and walking through the <laughs> matrix, right? I can see this shit. I don't need to, I can, it's like Braille. You can see it and feel it. But, you know, to, to the masses, everyone's going, oh, you know, Putin's a bad guy, right? Let's dye my hair pink, right? Whatever. Like, they, it's just, you know, yeah. Interesting. So, I think stage three tax cuts got preserved so that, is kind of counterintuitive and counter cyclical to what they're trying to achieve. So stage three tax cuts basically mean that if you're in a position where your salary is up to 200,000, uh, it's only gonna get taxed at 30%. So this is kind of what, uh, what's her name? The trust woman in the UK got booted out for. They were doing um, high income earner tax cuts. Yeah. Um, and so that was part of the policy. It and crashed the central bank. Like, it it killed the pound, it would have been good to buy. Pound. Um, but I think here in the Australian context here, what we're going to find is, is that it's going to be a lot of finger pointing and blaming. They're going to say the government, you know, the prior governments um, didn't do the right thing. They gave out or handed out too much stimulus. Um, and, you know, at the time of the stimulus, uh, Nathan and I were doing a couple of updates and, and budget recaps, um, you know, to his credit, he said that it's only going to increase, you know, until they can get their way out of it. So which is, is not what is necessarily happening, but it's happening in a different way. So they're increasing infrastructure spending, they're increasing in DIS um, spending, they're giving you know tax cuts. So they're sort of taking and giving at the same time because you can't just take now because the system is too, it's too much on a knife's edge, right? So it's a really interesting time. I think if you also look globally, 
Um, you know, the big fan companies have started to quietly lay off a lot of people. Um, you know, the way in which, you know, they were trying to entice certain people and certain employees to be able to work for them, that's backed off a lot as well. Um, and there is a lot of, I think, parking of cash and there's a lot of people who are sort of saving or keeping their power to drive for, to some examples, uh, to some extent. Um, but unfortunately, you know, myself and, and the rest of the ordinary people are going to be stuck with higher cost of living, higher uh, servicing requirements and all those type of things. So We spoke about that years ago, inflation, right? It's we like did. It's, it's coming yeah. to fruition and saying, oh, it's, you know, it's a global problem or whatever. Mm. It's sort of a global financial depression that we talked about. It's just so fun to watch it. It's so fun. There's something cool that I saw happen here. There's a there's a thing here saying the regional first home buyer guarantee will be will be offered to ten thousand people each year from October. The scheme will support regional first home buyers to purchase a new or existing homes with a deposit of just five percent. It is found funded with this budget. However, because Labor says it will f cover the cost by redirecting funds from a similar measure which was included in the March budget. So there's a housing investment fund of $350 million, right? So they're now stumping up 95% uh, loans for people that are going to get in the regional areas. What's it going to do to the areas? Going to push up those regional things. Mm. Luckily, we've been buying those things before <laughs> now, right? <laughs> and I think the critical element part here is is that um, if you continue to do those type of programs and you continue, which are good because obviously they help people get through and get home ownership, um, it won't help them if rates are high, right? Because if you're giving someone 95% debt, then you know <laughs> their sensitivity for interest rate risk is really high, um, and you know part of what I was going to present here was is that you know the budget papers will show that real GDP has been downgraded from 3.25% in 2023 and then <clears throat> falling to just 1.5% in 2023-24, which if you go back two or three years, even pre post you know pre COVID and leading into COVID, um, other than COVID, it was all cylinders firing. You know it was crazy how much the GDP. Um, uh, the GDP was being marketed as being, you know, the, 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 the holy number of, of growth for us. Now it says inflation will hit 7.75% in the final three months of the year and expected to remain at high levels well into 2023, which would likely delay increases to rural wages until 2024. Now, they also said the unemployment rate is expected to rise from its historically low levels of 3.5% to 4.5% in 23-24 and 24-25. So there's a there's a problem there. So real wages will go up mm -hmm. in 2024-25, but also will unemployment. Yeah. So the effectiveness of that will hit the, the internal household budgets, but on an overall GDP, GDP basis, you might struggle a little bit to be able to quantify the whole thing. On top of that, if inflation stays high, then it's going to be sitting, the real inflation that the RBA target is going to be sitting at 3.35, yeah. 3.5, which is higher than the 2 to 3% that they initially anticipate or they try to have target inflation at. Which will mean, unfortunately, and fortunately, is, is that they'll resile again from their position and rates will start to come down because yeah. they need to then make sure that inflation, where it was low before, and they're pushing it along and giving it, you know, it was at 0.1% or, you know, it was a half and then 0 0.2, 0 0.0, you know, whatever it was, and it came down to one. Yeah. Because inflation at that time was like, what, 1.7, 1.8? It was nothing. It was nothing. But just to get that 0.2, they were pumping in coal into the fire, right? And saying we need more. Now it's gone the other way. So that my, my point is that they've overshot on the way up and they've overshot on the way down. I just, right? had, I just had a thought about something, right? Imagine all my commercial properties, right? The rents are hinged at inflation or 3.3%, right? So 3% or inflation. Mm. So let's say we have inflation for the next five years at 10%, mm. right? That means that the rent will go up by 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, but doesn't come back down to that lease, right? Mm. So imagine all the businesses in the shopping centers, the Maccas, the, all yeah. that, they have to now add those extra costs into it. Like mm. it's, just, it's one cost after another because of this level of inflation. inflation it can yeah. never go away. Yeah. It can never inflation go is away. a real silent killer, right? It's a, yeah. And so I think what is going to be more and increasingly obvious is, is that the government debt, although it has no end or term date or term end, um, servicing that is going to become more and more problematic with the current levels of interest, it's right? Amazing. Um, <laughs> it's amazing. A trillion dollars of debt the country's in. The country's in a trillion dollars of debt and you've just increased it from 10 basis points to 260 basis points, right? Is it 2.6% now? Whatever it's at. Yeah, 2.6%, right? So the interest rate has gone up. The government's debt bill, they're paying cash rate basically in the bonds. They 
went up from 10 basis points to 260. That's 2,500% increase in the interest rate bill of the government of their trillion dollars worth of debt that they couldn't afford before yeah. that to get the debt. And correct, right? And so you've got you've got all these, you know, um, concurrent pressures which are going to be really difficult for us to navigate over the next, you know, 12, 24, 36 months, right? Um, and I think one of the indicators of that is that, you know, this budget that was meant to be presented or is being presented tonight is going to have a better than expected cash result of 32 billion, right? So you're cheering about 32 billion in a pool of a trillion, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there's, you know, really low, small wins that are that are, that are being, you know, coveted because it's such a big problem. Um, childcare is going to be a benefit um, to a lot of different working households with 96% of people going to be able to access some childcare rebate in some form. Um, obviously that is to mobilize a workforce and obviously get women who um, have been previously unable to work because of child minding historically um, to get them moving and get them into work. Um, whether that means that there is more jobs, less jobs in the future, it's going to be a little bit difficult to, to, um, to tell. But you know, one thing that's true generally when they start to make those changes in terms of subsidies, it's really hard to wind it back. Yeah. So if that number is really high, which I think it is, um, in terms of 96% being or 90% 96% um, uh, of people um, or families being able to access childcare of some sort, it's going to be really hard um, to be able to, to pull down. So um, the last bit of the puzzle that I had that you know Nathan can go through a little bit was the inflation piece. Mm -hmm. So Treasury will forecast that in the budget, inflation will peak at 7.75%. The economic growth is tipped um, to slow from 3.25 to uh, by 1.5 percent, but to just 1.5 percent. So it's quite a big dip in the coming two years. Um, and if that doesn't scare you, it should a little bit because a lot of what you see and a lot of the froth that's in the economy at the moment has been based on the last couple of years worth of. Um, Free stimulus. money, stimulus, and all that type of stuff. Your job keeper tattoo. You know. um, <laughs> I want to get Frydenberg on one arm tattooed, <laughs> and job keeper around here. And the amount of stimulus packages, that's what caused us to get. Yeah, it's, it's the, really accelerated are, right? this problem. Um, and so people are going to really, like governments, are going to struggle to reduce their standard of living. Um, now, while inflation is tipped to ease next year, um, I think as soon as those rates come down, you tell me what's going to happen. Recession. We're in a recession already. <laughs> we haven't even seen it, right? When you start sucking all this out, imagine shops, right? And so Rolex came out allegedly on an email, right? There's this email circulating around today, Rolex, and it says that they're going to drop because of energy prices, because they're doing the right thing for their ESG to minimize their emissions, because they do so much by making a fucking Rolex anyway, right? It <laughs> takes so much energy, right? I think making cars and, you know, anything from China would be a lot worse, but anyway. But they're going to do the right thing. They're going to slow down 50% of their production, right? But then when you go back through and look at articles, this, the, the amount of stock that is selling is dropped significantly because we're in a recession. And everything's in a recession yet. Imagine, we just touched on it before, and I said about the rents going up, right? You've got the rents going up for premises. You've got fuel going up. You've got all these things going up. The wage bill's going up. All these costs that are being put onto the businesses, there's a real separation here, right? The costs are increasing, but we're entering into a recession. That big gap, that's the fucking depression, right? Mm. And there's only one way to get through this, and that's to either print their way back up to keep that Ponzi scheme going alive, or if they hold it back, then we're going to see a massive depression. And we're going to see businesses that you never thought would go broke, go broke. Um, all these zombie companies coming out of the closet that we're all, you know, and it's not because it's Halloween or whatever, that's another fucking interesting <laughs> topic for discussion, right? But all the zombie companies coming out and, and blowing up. And, and you might have, you know, sort of stagnant asset prices for a long, long while. And where people have been, you know, relying on asset prices to generate wealth or have that wealth effect, you start to lose that velocity of money that Nathan's talking about because people go, well, hang on, my property's worth 100 grand less. I'm not going to do that trip. I'm not going to do Once that. Once the velocity slows down, that's when the, the wheels fall off. Once the velocity goes through the roof, once people realize that the money's there and they start to get the confidence in, it'll explode. Mm -hmm. So it's either an implosion or an explosion. There's no in between. There ain't no normal market out of this. And they've shown their, 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 their hand from what they have done up until now. And it's a calculated completely against the whole system for them to go backwards. 
Mm. So they have to keep up with inflation. Mm. That'll cause the hyperinflation, that'll cause the crash of our currency, that'll cause the, the debasement of it, that'll cause everyone to be forced into a digital credit system uh, over the next you know, two years, three years, five years, seven years. I did a video on this two years ago uh, on the other side of the wall over here um, on a whiteboard session talking about hyperinflation way before any of this stuff was discussed. They were talking about a recession, I was talking about hyperinflation, right? We've got massive inflation that came from the end of it. Most people are looking at six months or 12 months, oh, interest rates have gone up and the sky's falling in. Interest rates come back down, guys. I'm the first one to talk about it. I'll say it until I'm fucking blue in the face. They have to reduce interest rates, otherwise the whole system implodes, so. Raises is only the security. It would. <laughs> <laughs> Just made a comment about someone. Um, now, I just want to um, just share with everyone. These were notes that there's no one else in the office who's been with today. Um, these are notes that Rid just had that he bought in. They weren't things that were just printed off the net. I've been looking at different things that are the you know, more expanded versions on the internet at the moment. Um, however, Rid already had that because he you know, researched the pre-budget meetings and the notes and all that to be able to bring today. So very interesting time to be alive. Mm. Um, there's nothing really in the budget. There's a few things here that'll benefit me, like they're spending billions of dollars on fixing up the Great Barrier Reef, right? I've got all the motels they're doing, around. They're doing actually selling. one for you as well. They're uh, spending about half a billion on the uh, old Bruce Highway all the way up to Queensland. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. so, so I've, I literally have like 20 motels scattered along the Bruce Highway and uh, that's gonna benefit massively because they're gonna need accommodation for the workers. So. Yeah. Happy days. That'll keep me. Uh, that, that money will come straight from the government into my till, and then we can go and buy more shit with it. So it's great. It's a good time to be, <laughs> time to be alive, right? You got to be in it to win it. They say. Yeah, well, it's it, right? And, and what we think about, like, like, I've never been rich to be able to do something right, but the, they say the the wealthier just keep getting wealthier, right? And it does have that compound effect? Like we're seeing, like people that have built real wealth, so they're becoming more and more successful because they've got more hooks in the ocean to catch things, right? I mean, the the ten properties for ten years ago doubles from two hundred to four hundred, but then it goes from four hundred to eight hundred. It's the Johnny Come Later's that are the poor bastards that are paying, you know, two million dollars for a house that's on three hundred square meters of land with a tiled driveway, and you know, we all know someone that lives in one of them, and you know, they 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 they're the ones that are going to get squeezed on it, and that's yeah. Look, I think we don't want anyone to get squeezed. No, I but that's the bad that's, part. That's, that's yeah, the that's bad part. We don't want it. Reality, we don't want you know, it. You know, I think they your whole business more. is designed is trying to get people into that's some level system. of control. But the people that come later, <laughs> yeah, right? it's harder. I've come later. Yeah. I didn't pick up a property at 20 grand. Yeah. I'm having to pay a million bucks for a property, yeah. right? But that's a, it's a it's when you hop on the train, people are going to be watching. They're going to go, "I'll come in in the future." Yeah, I'm no, scared of the yeah, interest rates. Yeah. I'm scared of a recession. I'm scared of Ukraine. I'm scared of fucking gas prices in Russia, right? And all that stuff doesn't matter. Like, there's always something. There was when I first started investing, I bought my first property just after nine eleven, right? And it's like you know everyone thinks oh the sky's going to fall through and all this sort of shit. And it's like there was a recession coming from that. What they did, they printed their way through it, and mm. they've shown their hand decade after decade it's always you know a first home buyer like they're making regional towns in their budget 95 percent of the art imagine taking out a loan in a regional town paying a million dollars for a house of land package in you a do. regional town hey you do no i wouldn't pay i'll buy a motel <laughs> for that right i'll buy them for like you know but the thing is is that people that are paying that they're the ones that are now creating all the new liquidity but they're attached to the loan and 95 percent for a million dollar loan in the regional town like mm. uh, yeah it's problematic it. yeah right so a, i think a, i think there's no good answers to any of this because they've no. created a really big problem which you need you need time right we didn't get that in australia you know japan uh european countries especially the uk for example had low rates for really long time so that people could sort of bolster their way and save their way and get used to certain things. The US have 30 year fixed loans, right? Mm. So you got to loan 4%, it doesn't really matter what the rest of the world is yeah. doing, it's there until you pretty much die. Um, in Australia, we have these variable loans. But that's loans the thing, and it's, right? It's you really take that loan to the grave, like it sits yeah. out of your house, yeah, like you've yeah. got it. Like, yes, if you buy a property, if, if you bought a property 10 years ago, you're better off. If you buy a property five years ago, you're better off than today. And it's just gonna keep it continuing prep perpetrate like people say about a bubble right mm. this is where i'm going to with my you know who's going to pay for it right the people that keep buying in the future are the ones that are going to be paying more and more to sit at the table it's and it's getting as much asset as you can like the delorean right the back to the future delorean i've always talked about i want a delorean right marty mcfly takes it back to the future i imagine going back and being able to pick up all the stuff you can if you can go back and buy stuff there's places in australia today 
they're cheaper than what they were 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, and they're still at it. Yeah. Everyone's buying into the hype and the bubble and mm. the... Yeah, Both yeah. ways, on the way up and the way down. Yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. So. Yeah. But um, I think there will be a budget update that we might come mm. together and, and do. You'll do a proper video yeah, on it. Yeah, we'll do a proper yeah. one, um, which has all the uh, the different elements and how you can um, look at certain parts of the budget, you know, cost of living, what the, you know, the tax cuts mean to you and your family. Um, and we're more than happy to do that because um, it's, always a good, um, it's always a good session. Mm. Thanks for coming in, Rude. No worries. Thanks for having me. Thanks for everyone for watching. Thanks for everyone for tuning in uh, and being part of our evening. Let's have a look at a couple of questions. Everyone's got... uh, Mount Brook, uh, Military Super. Yeah, they're actually all right. I don't know a huge amount about them, but generally the government ones are pretty good. Yeah. Hey, Lisa. Um, Lydia said, is there going to be any further interest rate increases into 2023? I think we're at the top of the cycle. You reckon? Yeah, I reckon the top of the cycle. I reckon one more, like next week we'll get one. We'll get one. No, I I think they'll give us a break into Christmas. They'll get one on the way out February. No, they're going to get us next week. No, you reckon? Yeah, well, give me two seconds. I'll tell you. I just need to keep an update because I haven't... I reckon they'll give us a break into Christmas. No, I don't think so. It's been a crappy year. No, no, no. (laughs) Um, (laughs) At this point, I'm saying we're going to get a a rate hike next month and that'll probably be one of the last rate hikes that we'll see. I'm um, banking February. I don't bet, but I'm banking February. I reckon next month. Yeah. <laughs> I reckon next month. And I think we're at a point where we're going to be, be coming back. Um, uh, Hesh said, these kind of discussion webinars, should everyone, rather than their couch podcast, with no information. But thank you very much for the, the feedback. Um, uh, Stephen said the... Patrick Bet David keynote that you mentioned was very good. I'll share it into the Birch feed. Um, just it was a, just a good motivational video. There's no conspiracy, no nothing there. It's just a, a nice video that he had. Um, always thinking about that stuff when doing deals as well. Uh, Johnny, would you agree that the trust is making profit will help when servicing is tight? Possibly. Um, it'd be something to work out how it's structured and how you can distribute those funds and who'll be taking that profit. Mm. So it yeah. isn't, It's not straightforward. It really depends on the lender, that one. You need to get the, the lending side of things right plus the structuring side mm. of things. So there's two parts to that. Um, I self-managed my three properties, had to fire all three property managers because it was more work to manage them. Sometimes it can be. Yeah, it can um, be, yeah. But you don't want to be, you know, if you've got three, then going to 30, it's going to be much more um, tougher. Uh, Mark said here, global digital commie enslavement, China social credit score, Canadian truckers' accounts frozen, PayPal, CBA, and more has hit their terms and conditions. They can close your accounts based on your social media posts or opposing the climate no, agenda. Is that true? That's crazy. Wow. Yeah. yeah. People are being blocked out for more different things. So um, someone asked me the other day, what do I think of this bloke on the internet? He's gone crazy. His name's Andrew Tate, right? He's this uh, guy that has really outlandish sort of views. I've, I've seen his videos. You've seen his videos. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't have feedback on it, right? I, I find some of those things very good, what he says. Some of them are like, it's a bit far-fetched. People might say the same thing about me. Um, so I'm not a, a fanboy of him. But what I found interesting was when he got... Uh, taken down off the internet, right? They closed his Airbnb, his Uber. He has mm, a museum yeah, for years, right? Video. Yeah, 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 I saw yeah, the video. I was yeah. like, that's very bad, right? Like, yeah, that's yeah. very bad for them to be able yeah. to have the power to turn yeah, them off. Yeah, they can shut you out socially. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's just very interesting. So mm. um, that is crazy, though. Yeah. Take control of your life, folks. Live life in your terms. Have the ability to, um, you know, live free and be able to have cash flow coming through and. You know, whatever your lifestyle is that you're looking for, try and you know, make the right steps, appropriate steps in order to be able to you know, get to that end position. On that note, folks, um, just want to thank everyone for watching. If thank you, you do want much. to get in contact with Ridwan, reach out to my team. Uh, you can email my office at admin at um, You can call my office, 1300 um, You can send us a message on socials and um, yeah we'll put you in contact I'd love to help and, uh, and see what we can get Red one's very sought after like people want to you know they have to line up and get in a queue to no, 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 no. We'll just, we'll just get you in as quick He's as we very, can and then, he will uh, get you in as quick yeah. as he can but there, there, there is a sort of process so yeah. um, reach out to my team um, there's no sort of links or anything around here tonight um, but email us admin at beinvested.com.au uh, read one uh, from one path accountant thanks a lot for coming in mate appreciate right. that thanks for having me we'll catch up soon guys take care have a good one bye for now